Let me invite you now to take your copy of God's Word and turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. A few months ago, I walked into my pantry and I flipped the light switch. Well, I thought I was flipping the light switch. All of a sudden, the light switch was broken. Who knew I had such strength in my fingers and my arms? And... But the light switch was broken. Well, I knew that it had to be fixed. It had to be taken care of quickly because it is hard to find my peanut butter and crackers. It's hard to find my Oreos without a light in the pantry. So I went over to Lowe's. Oh, you know you can do anything with YouTube. And I realized I could watch YouTube, watch that video, and I could figure out how to fix this. So I went over to Lowe's, and I bought a new switch, got everything together, came back, started working on it. Um, actually, YouTube didn't help me all that I needed. I had to call a couple of people and say, hey, does this wire, this red one, does it go in here or does it go in there? And they said, just hold on, we're coming over there in just a moment. So anyway, we finally got it all fixed and everything, and I flipped the switch. Well, the light didn't come on. And I thought, okay, I followed the YouTube advice. I followed the advice of these other folks, and it didn't come on. What's going, what's going on? We, we began to look at it, and, all, and then I realized that when I was at Lowe's, I bought a switch. It's a switch that would work, but it was a switch that had a dimmer on it. And the dimmer had not been pulled up. So all I had to do was just switch a little bit of the dimmer and all of a sudden there was light. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't purposely dim my pantry very often. I do look lovingly at the Chips Ahoy that's there, but I don't necessarily dim the lights in order to enhance the experience. But sometimes, sometimes that little slide will get off. A few weeks ago, my mother-in-law was here and she was keeping the kids while we were gone. We got back. She said, do you know you can't see anything in that pantry? I said, you can't see anything in that pantry? She said, I can't see. I couldn't see any. You all need to get that. I started to call somebody to get that fixed. I said, hey, by the way, there's a little dimmer switch here. And all you got to do is like pull it. Oh, look, it's light. She said, what? She said, you didn't tell me that? I, I just, no, I didn't tell you that. And to be honest with you, I kind of got tickled about it that my mother-in-law couldn't see the whole week. So I'm sorry the Lord Jesus is still working on me, all right? He's still working. He's still working. You know, for us as believers, we're going to see today how the Lord has called us to shine, to shine as lights, to shine as stars. But there can be moments where it seems like either our switch is broken or we've got a dimmer on where we're not shining as brightly as we should. And I pray that today, as we hear Paul's words from Philippians chapter 2, that we will be challenged to shine like the stars, to shine forth in our work, in our word, and in even our worldview as we come before others. Listen to what Paul says, beginning in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. He writes, Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world." holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Paul writes to them and he says, that you are to shine like the light. You are to shine like the stars. You are to shine. You are to give forth the very testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. It shouldn't surprise you 
Because even when Jesus was giving his sermon on the mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, he said, you are the light of the world. He said, you are the one to give light. Now, I know some people read Scripture and you'll say, well, Jesus said he was the light. And now he says, we're the light. And Paul says, we're to shine. We are to reflect the light of Jesus to those that we come in contact with. There is a sense of where we are people who are shining the light of Jesus each and every day. And Paul writes to these Philippians and he says, you have a responsibility. You are to shine like the stars. You are to shine as lights in the cosmos. You are to shine as lights for me. Now, let me show you how he works this out. He tells us that we need to shine, and he tells us how we need to shine. Going back to verse 12, he says, Therefore, some of your translations may say, So then, my beloved. In other words, he's continuing the argument from the verses that he had previously given us. Remember last week, we talked about how Christ is our example. In Philippians 2, 5 through 11, Paul said, Christ is the example. Christ is the one who humbled himself. Christ was the one who became a servant for you. Christ was the one who died on a cross for you. And then God highly exalted him. So get this. He says, when you're thinking about your life and how you are living it out, you need to remember that Christ is your example always that Christ was not just a servant, but he was your Savior, and that he is highly exalted. In other words, what you believe about Jesus and the gospel will inform how you shine to others. It will inform your everyday actions. He says, therefore, my beloved. In other words, it's not just about theory. It's about practice. And see, I believe when we come together, we do study God's word on Sunday morning. But it should impact us on Monday morning. That when we come together, it's great, it's great to hear a good sermon. But if a good sermon does not move people to action, it is not a good sermon. Because it must be something that will capture our hearts and our lives and remind us that we are to live out. If we're going to shine, we must shine forth in our work, in our action. So he says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He says, you are to work out your salvation. He did not say you need to work for your salvation. It's not what he's saying here. You know, when people take a verse like this and they use it out of context, oftentimes they could try to press it to mean you got you to gotta work for your salvation. See, you got to keep your works. You, you know, or maybe you were saved, but in order to keep your salvation, you got to keep working. That's what Paul says. There is nothing about Paul that would indicate a work salvation. Nothing. You go back and read any of Paul, you will see that it is by grace that you are saved through faith. Not of yourselves. Not of yourselves. He says, nobody should be able to boast in his or her own work. It is not through works that you're saved. There's some of you who are sitting here today and you think you're so good and somehow that's the way you'll get into heaven. I'm telling you, you will never know heaven through your works. But you can know heaven through his work. As Jesus Christ died for you and gave his sacrifice for you, if you have trust in him and faith in him, one of these days when you get to heaven... If you were to be asked why you're there, you're not there because you've been good. It's because you know the good one. You're not there because you've done good works. It's because the work of Jesus took care of everything for you. That's what Paul has taught. That's what he teaches throughout. So what does he mean here when he says, work out your salvation? He's talking about how we work out what God has worked in. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you see that? He says, you work out what God has worked in. God has already worked in something in your heart and life. He's already made a difference in who you are. You cannot shine for the king unless the king has done an inward work in your life. So you work out. There's human responsibility coupled with divine grace. 
that God has blessed us and set us apart. And we are to work out who he is in our lives. Note this, by the way. This is a message to believers. He's writing to believers. He's not writing to unbelievers and telling them how to be saved. He's writing to believers who are saved of how they are to conduct themselves as they go out to speak the word of Christ. The word work out. It speaks of considerable effort. That you give effort to how you shine for Christ. Listen, God has always called us to be people who will work for the kingdom. It's not work salvation. It's what I call salvation works. In other words, I don't work for my salvation, but when I am saved, I want to work because I am saved, because God's done something in my life. It is considerable effort. It is considerable energy. I've told you many times about how God, through the years, spoke to me about work. He allowed my dad to be an example in my life, and I watched him through the years as a truck driver, worked very hard, and spoke to me about how we ought to have a work ethic as well in our community, but also in the kingdom of God, that we ought to work for the kingdom. The terminology to work out was a word that would be used sometimes to speak about people who would go out into the field and they would work in a field expecting a harvest. That word work out, it was used not only of laborers in the field, but it would always speak, it would also speak to those who were in the mines, that they were mining with the hopes of finding a valuable resource. For example, maybe a diamond. It would even be used, my math teachers, I saw some of you, this word would also be used in the New Testament time to talk about working out a mathematical formula in order to find an answer. In other words, it was diligent work, but it knew that there was something at the end that would be culminated, either a harvest or a valuable resource or an answer. When we work for the kingdom, do we not work knowing that there is something God has provided for us? Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, that we covered a few weeks ago, said, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, God's working in me, and I'm working it out as he's spoken to me because there is a day coming when there is something that he will give to us, something we couldn't even begin to imagine. And how does he say we do it? He says, do it with fear and trembling. Do it with fear and trembling. Now, Brother Reggie, I thought we weren't supposed to fear. The Bible tells us all the time, fear not. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Timothy, God didn't give you a spirit of fear. So how do you reconcile the passages where there's no fear and now Paul says there needs to be fear? What Paul is saying is, is when you are working, you are working in awe of God. It is not a fear that paralyzes you. It is a fear that prepares you. It is a fear to help you to work in awe of God. It is good to remember He's God. Yes, he's my best friend, but never forget he's also king. He is on the throne. And that should motivate us as we serve him. It should motivate us to realize that we can't do this on our own. That we do it with trembling. Because it is in weakness that we serve him. It is through his strength in our lives that we get to know him. It is also in the way of the effort and the diligence to be able to work out. Do you know when I was studying this passage, I found in Romans 127 that this verb was used to talk about men, depraved men, who would commit indecent acts. That's the way it reads, to commit. The word commit is the same as work out. As someone has said, you and I, listen, You and I ought to have the same commitment, actually greater commitment, greater pleasure in working out the fruit of the kingdom than those who would work out those things that are indecent in our culture today. We ought to be even more motivated because God has worked in us so that we can work out. 
it is important that our actions shine forth and that we have a testimony, that we're different. We're different. This past week, I've been in Clarksville, Tennessee. I don't know if you know where Clarksville, Tennessee is, home of Austin P. I was there on that campus most of the week as I was preaching to a group of youth. This week, somebody heard that I was going to preach a youth camp, and they wanted to make sure that they had heard correctly. They thought I had gone to preach a senior adult camp because I have much more in common with the senior adults than I do youth. Brother Dale, the altar is open for repentance at the end of this service, okay? (laughs) The theme of the week was set apart, different. All week long, I've preached to youth that they're to be different, that they are to demonstrate in their actions a difference in serving the King, King Jesus. But I'm going to tell you this. I don't care if you're 16, if you're 36, if you're 86. It really doesn't matter. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to be different. When I look at the scripture, I don't see age-specific requirements. In other words, of saying to 16-year-olds, I I told them this week, 16-year-olds, if you're a believer, you're a believer in Christ, you should reflect him. When I was growing up, I'd hear people say, well, you know, they're kids, kids will be kids. Oh, you know, that this and that. Listen, we all mess up. I'm not saying we don't mess up. But there is never an excuse for a believer to, to commit sin in some type of willful way just because he says, I'm young. And there's nothing for you, even when you're older, that excuses you. Your action should demonstrate who you are. As I've told my kids through the years many times when they walked out the door, remember who you are and remember whose you are. And in our culture today, we need people who are shining forth in their actions, in their testimonies. We need people who are working hard for the kingdom. We need people that demonstrate determination in their obedience. No matter who they believe is watching. Go back to verse 12 again. This is the second time Paul really mentioned this, but he talked about how they obeyed, not just when he was there, but also when he wasn't there. He understood that his presence would put some pressure on them to obey. He was the apostle. But he said, something that I've noted, the report that he had gotten from the Philippian Philippian church is this, is that even though he wasn't there physically, they were still obeying. So do you obey because of outward pressure or do you obey because of inward power? Warren Wiersbe said that there are too many of us that we simply obey because of that outward pressure that's put upon us, not for the inward power that God has given to us. We obey because we believe people are watching. We obey sometimes because we're afraid that it'll get back to others. Children, they obey because their parents are standing there. Or they're afraid their parents will find out And let me say to you who are youth, if you're in Ruston, Louisiana, they will find out. (laughs) But do we obey simply because of outward pressure? Or do we do it because there's been an inward change? Do we obey when people aren't watching? Men, let me ask you this. Do you obey the Lord Jesus Christ when you go on your business trip? When you're outside of Ruston, you're all alone. When you know nobody's there, you believe nobody will see you, do you obey? Because when you work out your salvation, you work out your salvation, it doesn't matter who's watching, it doesn't matter what's happening, you are committed, you are determined to obey because the Lord Jesus Christ has made a difference in your life. We must shine. 
the way we shine is that we work out our salvation. We let our work, our action, show forth our testimony of Christ. But notice, he also says that you need to let your word shine forth. He says in verse 14, Do all things without complaining and disputing. He says, do all things without complaining and disputing. He said, in the way you speak to one another and the things you talk about, your word somehow ought to shine forth for Christ. Specifically, he says, don't complain. Specifically, he says, don't dispute. Complaining. The word there carries with it the idea of grumbling. Literally, in the Greek, it sounds like you are mummering. You ever been around somebody that mummers a lot? Like, you can just, like, hear it under their... People that just murmur. People that complain. People that dispute. That word dispute means debating. Literally, it's like through reason or through logic, they are constantly debating. Now, I'm not saying that you and I shouldn't stand for the truth. I'm not saying that we shouldn't declare what is right. I think you know me better than that. But what he's talking about here is the negativity of complaints and disputes. It echoes back to Moses. I hear the children of Israel and Moses, I hear echoes of that here in this passage. One of the reasons is when you get down and you hear him speak about a, this crooked and perverse generation, that is a direct quote from Deuteronomy 32, 5, when Moses was really finishing out his ministry and he was looking back and God was speaking through him, he recognized that there were those, even the people of Israel, that complained a lot and they disputed about everything. Have you ever read the book of Numbers before? I've always said it ought to be the book of complaints. Because when you read through Numbers, complaints everywhere. The people of God, and actually this week, I preached on the life of Moses. Every message in the evening, I gave about how Moses had been set apart. So I've been studying this this week. I've been reminded that God did an awesome work in their lives by bringing them out of Egypt, bringing them freedom. 430 years they had been enslaved. In one night of the Passover, God worked and they were released. Just like some of us who go in our sin for so long and we're enslaved. And just like that, in one instance, of faith in Jesus Christ, we can be freed from our sin. That's amazing, isn't it? So they're freed. They don't have the Egyptian army telling them what to do. They don't have some Pharaoh. They don't have, they're freed. They go out in the wilderness. They've got freedom. But man, they don't have the air condition they did there in Egypt. What I mean is, they don't have the comfort, it seems like. And they began to complain about their predicament. They complain about their predicament. They complain about their water. They complain about their food. They've been given manna, and they finally say, we need some meat. All this manna, we need some meat. They complain. They complain about the leadership of Moses. I'm telling you, Numbers is all about the people of God complaining and disputing. They dispute. They get to Kadesh Barnea, where they're supposed to go in and take the promised land. Twelve spies sent in. They come out. Ten of them began to debate whether or not it's even a good thing, though God told them that they should go in and take the land. Ten still debate whether or not God's got a good plan. They dispute. There's this one passage where it says that there's a leader named Korah. And Korah leads this group against Moses' leadership. And Moses is broken over it, and he's talking to God, and God said, Hey, you don't worry about this. I've got this taken care of, because you do know God can fight your battles for you. 
So God said, I got this taken care of. You just need to get away from their tents tomorrow morning. Moses said, okay. And he told everybody else, you might ought to get away from their tents. They go out there that morning. They begin to speak. Those who are on Moses' side, those who are on Korah's side. And even as Korah has led this rebellion, the Bible says that, y'all, some of you remember this? The Bible says that the ground opens up, swallows them, and then closes right back up. John Eugene, I think he's up in the gathering this morning. John, when I was a youth minister many, many years ago, and we were getting ready to go on a camp or mission trip, I would meet with our Sunday school class. We only had one youth Sunday school class, but we'd meet with the youth Sunday school class on Sunday morning, and I'd take them to a study of numbers. And I'd always say, listen, the people complained. The people disputed. And you know what God did? He opened the ground and he swallowed all those people. So if I hear you complaining, I hear you disputing, you never know. God's, God's still the God of yesterday. He can still open the ground and swallow your van and bus. I know I've come a long way in my learning. But it worked kind of back then. Their eyes would be that big on Sunday morning. Folks, we need to really be careful about the way we complain and dispute. You know, we have sports talk, news talk. We have people on social media constantly criticizing and disputing and debating. Even sometimes well-meaning people in the church, we can fall into that negativity. When we used to get home from Birmingham Ridge Baptist Church, just within a few minutes, the phone would ring. It would be my Aunt Key. My Aunt Key was a shut-in. But my Aunt Key would call and she'd say, now what happened to church today? I heard, now listen, we only lived about a mile away from the church. But by the time we greeted everybody after church and made it home, word had already reached my Aunt Key. She had want to know what happened. You know, you've been there, you've heard these conversations. Oh, you've heard them. Maybe you get home and you're sitting around, you're talking. Oh, you know, at worship service day, a little bit long, a little bit long. Music kind of loud. Man, that music was like, preacher, man, I like the way he was dressed. He looked good. But he's preaching on the book of Philippians. And we've been in Philippians forever. It's like he can't get all Philippians. Why can't he preach a Good series. Go to another book. Why can't he go and preach a series on Genesis? I ain't heard one of those in 20 years or so. Why would he do that? Well, I'm proud you could hear Brother Reggie and know because, you know, I was just so distracted this morning. You know, did you see Bertha Sue? Bertha Sue had that polka dot purple blouse on, and it did not go with those red stripes on her pants. You know that. I couldn't even focus this morning. So, well, you couldn't focus you know, when Clyde, when he brought the offering plate by, he, I, I mean, I think he was looking at me the whole time, see what I was going to give him. You know what? I didn't give anything because I wasn't going to give him the satisfaction. <laughs> and that usher back there, you know, that guy named Bill Cox, he spoke to me this morning. He knows I don't like him, and he speaks to me just to aggravate me every time I come in that place. <laughs> don't act like you hadn't heard these conversations. Don't act like it. D. James Kennedy, some years ago, the late D. James Kennedy, he said that sometimes we look at church as a drama. He said, it's as though the pastor is the chief actor, God is the prompter, and the congregation is the critic. He said, but what we really need to see is this. The congregation is the chief actor, the pastor is the prompter, and God, he always is the critic. We need to remember that God has called us to be people who do not engage in complaint and dispute. 
Again, we can state those things, I think, in a good spirit. Hey, maybe we can do these better. Maybe we can do that better. Maybe we can't. But complaining, murmuring, and disputing. In the Greek, the first words of this sentence, all things. All things do. That's the first in the Greek because the, prim- the priority is on all things. Doesn't matter what it is, no matter what you do, all things, all things, without grumbling and disputing so that you can be blameless and pure. Did you hear that? So that you can be blameless and pure. You can be above reproach. If you're going to shine like the stars, if you're going to shine the way you need to shine, you need to shine in your words. Okay, if you don't remember anything else, just just remember this. If you whine, you can't shine. If you grumble, you're probably going to make somebody stumble. He says it's all about your testimony. Let us shine forth in our words. Whether it be in the word that we speak personally to somebody, whether it's the word we put on a social media post, whatever it is. He says, let us shine. Let us shine in our words, in our work. Let us shine in our worldview. He says in verse 16, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason you also ought to be glad and rejoice. I don't know if you're picking up a theme, but he says, your worldview needs to be a worldview that is based around joy, around gladness. You should recognize that God is in charge, whatever circumstance you find yourself in. Some of you would say, well, that's nice for Paul to say. He just writes that, and then remember, Paul is under arrest in Rome when he writes this. That's the reason he says, even if I'm being poured out, even if it's coming to the end of my life, I'm rejoicing, I'm glad. You see, that's what joy will do. When you look at God and realize God can take all these things and use them for his good, our good and his glory, you can have joy. You can have joy. I didn't say you'd always be happy. I didn't, I didn't say you could always be happy. You can go find a church. They'll tell you how you can always be happy. You won't be, but they'll tell you how you can always be happy. But you can always be joyful. Happy is an emotion. Joy is a contentment. Emotionally, I may not always feel happy, but I'll tell you this. Down deep, if you were to pull it out, I hope and pray you would find joy still in my heart. Even through tough times, difficult times. He says, even if I'm being poured out, even if this is my moment where I take my final stand for Christ, I rejoice. He said, I don't just rejoice for myself, I rejoice for you. Aren't you proud when people are actually happy for you and joyful for you? You'll meet some of those people in life, you know, like friends that will cheer you on and I know there are people out there that are envious, and if you achieve something for the kingdom, you know, but I'm telling you, there are some real, genuine, authentic people around. That's one of the reasons I love Temple Baptist Church is because I feel like we can cheer one another on because we're rooting on what God's doing in each other's lives. Paul said, I'm rejoicing in you, and I'm asking you to shine forth because I know I haven't run in vain. I don't want to have run in vain or labored in vain. Don't you like it when you see your kids do well? Don't you like it when you see your grandkids do well? Paul said, I love it when I see my children in the faith there at Philippi do well. Sometimes I walk around this community and I see people who are here today who are shining like the stars.
how grateful I am and what joy I have in my heart. Because, my friends, it's easy to avoid the complaining and disputing if you're a person of joy. This week, uh, while I was up in Clarksville, I did talk about being the salt and the light. Salt of the earth, light of the world. I talked to them one day about that. And I reminded them, for example, with the analogy of salt, that salt will sometimes make you thirsty. Like you eat a bag of chips, you got to have a drink. Salt will sometimes, I'm not saying that's the primary reason that it was mentioned in the New Testament, but it is one of the byproducts of salt, just make you thirsty. And I, and I just asked them, have you made anybody thirsty for Jesus lately? And I ask you. Because just like I told you a moment ago, if you whine, you're not going to shine. Some people don't want your Jesus because all you ever do is complain. What if we had joy in our hearts and lives where people would see that joy and it would be contagious? Because we shine in our works, we shine in our word, and we shine in our worldview of how we look at the life and how we see the sovereignty of God working through us. You know, stars shine at night. Now, I know some of you say, well, I don't know. You know, when it's real clear, you can kind of see. Stars shine best at night. You can see them best at night. So Paul said that you are to be above reproach in a crooked and perverse generation. Word crooked, Greek word is scolios. You ever heard of scoliosis? Some type of curvature? He says, there's a world that's crooked out there. It doesn't line up with the standard. It doesn't line up with the scripture. It's going to be, it's going to be off. Perverse means twisted. It's going to be twisted. So here we are. We're right at the, what we celebrate as the birth of our nation. And we recognize there's a generation that's dark. But darkness has always existed. Because sin has always existed. There's always been individuals not measuring up to the mark. But what Paul says is, you can shine forth like the stars. Because when it gets darker, the light, the light shines brighter. Look up at the sky tonight. Look at the stars shining. Come tomorrow night. Not only will you see the real stars, you'll see, see some artificial stars we put up in the sky for you. And when you look at those things, you be reminded. You be reminded that God has a purpose and he has a plan for you. And he wants you to shine forth in the darkness. To shine forth in your work and in your word and in the worldview that you carry. Because only then will the gospel be proclaimed as powerfully and as effectively as it should be in your life, in my life. And only then will we truly see a change and transformation happen in our culture. My friends, if the switch is broken, let the Lord work on you today. If you've got the dimmer down, let God take it and move it back up so that you can shine like the stars. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the moments that you've given us. And Lord, I pray right now that some of us in this place would just take this moment of invitation and commitment and we'd come back to you. And Lord, we would 
recommit ourselves. God, that we would that we would recommit ourselves to relationship with you and to the purpose you've called us of shining forth to others. God, we bow our actions before you. We bow our language before you. We bow our attitude before you today. And God, we pray that you'd make us what you want us to be. Help us to work out what you're working in. God, even now, during this moment, help us to repent of ungodly attitudes, ungodly words, and ungodly actions. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?